Hello, I'm Arnon de Kaiser, a trustee of the Western Historical Society. With me is Karen Giannitti, a native Westonite who is deeply knowledgeable about the history of the town, and was a longtime volunteer as a collections manager for the Society, as well as the editor of The Chronicle, its historical almanac. Today is January 14th, 2016, and Karen and I are here to interview Judy Alvin. Judy lives in the historic Moore House home, which dates back to 1859. She has been a commercial artist, a teacher's aide in the Weston Elementary School, and a well-known local volunteer. Judy is also well-versed on the history of Weston's Moorehouse family, whose ancestors fought in the Civil War. Today, Judy continues to express her creativity in her art, samples of which decorate the walls of her home. Thank you for inviting us into your home, Judy. Let me start off by asking, when and where did you grow up? Well, I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I lived there until I was about five, uh, six years old when my stepfather's business, he worked for White Tower, they moved 20 families east and they wanted to open up a main branch in Stamford. We ended up in Rowayton, and that's where I basically grew up until shortly before I was married. Okay. Um, what was your family circumstances? You, you moved there, you lived in a, in a home as, versus an apartment type of thing? Well, when I was born, um, my sister was also born two years after me and my mother left our biological father. And before she married uh, our stepfather, we went from place to place and she had no way of financially taking care of us while she worked. And we did end up in an orphanage in Mars, Pennsylvania for a period of about eight months until she married my second stepfather, and it was he whose company he worked for White Tower that brought us to Rowayton, for which I'm extremely grateful because it was a wonderful town to grow up in. So you had one younger sister, any brothers? One younger brother, he was 10 years younger than I, he was born when we got to Rowayton. And, um, I was captivated by him. You know, I was 10 years old, and here's this brand new baby, like a living baby doll. Yeah. I was excited. <laughs> um, what kinds of things did you do as a kid? Were you, you know, did you just play outside? Did you have free range, like they call it now, free range children? <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, in Rowayton, we were fortunate because back in the 40s, um, 1941 was when we moved here and my uh, brother was born in 44 and Rowayton was a very small community and we were able to get on our bikes walk all over town everybody in that community knew who we kids were knew our parents so if we went off the track so to speak it was told to our oh, yes. parents and <laughs> get away with sure. the thing. No, no, we could not. One of the fun things we did do was to take a penny bike ride, and that was to get on our bikes. And when we came to the end of the road where we had to turn left or right, we'd flip the coin. Heads, we would go one way, tails the other. And we did this all around oh, until fun. we would come to a road that we weren't too sure we wanted to take because we didn't know it. So we would cancel that coin flip. <laughs> but that was one of the fun things we did. And we skated at the old school pond. We went swimming down at Bailey Beach. Uh, we were just all over that town. Mm -hmm. Played ball, softball, and uh, it was great. Mm -hmm. um, what kinds of things, were your meals pretty much the same as what you cook today? Or were they more limited or? Oh, sort of. Um, my mother was a very good cook. 
And um, one of the things she made was a good macaroni and cheese, which I in turn did for my family, which became the favorite meal here. What are we having? Mac and cheese? Oh, yes! They would be excited. <laughs> that seems um, to be a universal. Yes, yeah, that hasn't well, changed. Everybody. <laughs> right. Did you shop? Was there much shopping in Rowayton, or did you have to go to Norwalk or Stanford to do big shopping? Um, basically, any large amount, my mother went to an AMP in Darien or mm -hmm. South Norwalk. She would go up there. Mm -hmm. So, And we had buses. You know that you could hop on and take your bus. That's right. Okay. Um, when did you realize that you had a talent for art? Did you always draw, Judy? So. No, I. The only time I remember it first coming into play was when I went to the Rowayton Elementary School, and we would have an art teacher who would come in periodically, and she would have a lesson, and we all would have to do the same drawing. And my drawings usually came out very well, and she would show the class. Mm -hmm. And it got to a point where my friends would say, Judy, would you draw this roof for me? Or would you draw this tree? I can't make it right. And then paper dolls were pretty mm -hmm. well known then. Exactly. And my sister and I had uh, our supply. And I used to take my paper doll and lay her down on a piece of paper and draw the outline of a new wardrobe and mm -hmm. color them in and cut them out and it was wonderful fun. Oh yeah, McCall seems to have them every month. You know, I know, that was scene. great. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you go to high school in Rowayton or did you go to that area? No, uh, Rowayton only had elementary school up to grade six and then seven, eight, and nine we got on a bus that took us up to Benjamin Franklin Junior High in South Norwalk on Flax Hill Road. Oh. And that's where we went for junior high. Mm -hmm. Then, after we graduated from there, we went to senior high for grades 10, 11, and 12, and that was the Norwalk High School, and it was on East Avenue. It's now the town hall, mm -hmm. which makes me sad because I really loved the high school, and now yeah. it's so changed. It's changed, it's, yeah. Yeah. Externally, it's okay. But. Okay. Um, so now we get into your adulthood um, and meeting Ernie. Ah. <laughs> I tell us met about that? Ernie uh, when I was 13. I was in the Girl Scouts, and we had a... Square dancing was very popular then. And we planned a square dance, a number of them, but the first one in a neighbor's barn. And we girls were to invite a boy to go to the square dance. So I gathered up my courage because I had seen Ernie a couple of times, <laughs> liked him. He had incredible eyes, but most of all, of a, a wonderful smile. And so I got courageous and I called and asked him to the square dance. And he said, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> and one day he came up the road on his bicycle and uh, there was a little boy across the street from our house that his chain had slipped off his bike. And Ernie went over to help him fix it. And he came over and he, I had gone to the door and um, he said, do you have a screwdriver? And I thought, oh, please, God, let me have a <laughs> screwdriver and know where it is. So I found one. Thank God, ran out, gave it to him. When he returned it, he said, oh, about that square dance. He said, yeah, I can go. I said, oh, great. I took the square dance, the, the screwdriver, managed to get into the house, flopped down on the couch and said, he said yes. <laughs> And uh, as I say, I was at the ripe old age of 13, and when I got to the riper age of 23, we met at the altar in Rowayton, and we were married. So you actually dated all that time? I mean, no. We dated really off dated and we on. I mean, we were a nucleus of teenagers with a an age span of three to four years. Mm -hmm. uh, even though we had friends at Norwalk High School, 
Rowayton was a community unto itself. And we did a lot of things. Square dancing, as I said, was popular. And they had them at the school periodically. Norwalk uh, Rec Commission had formal dances with a live band down at uh, the beach in one of the big uh, veranda mm -hmm. buildings. And so we would get together there. Canasta became popular. We went to different houses and played Canasta, spin the bottle, and a few <laughs> other things. Tisk, tisk. Shocking. <laughs> And had a grand time. And as I say, it was on and off again. He went to a prep school in Maine and then to the University of Maine. And I went to what is now Central Connecticut and then to school in Ohio. And then he went into the Navy. So our communication was through letters. He was terrible at writing letters. And um, then... Navy, he would come home once a year because he was stationed in, in San Diego. And um, one Christmas when he came home, uh, we had moved from Rowayton to West Norwalk. And he came to the house in West Norwalk. And um, we reestablished our relationship. And we had a, a party with all of our friends in the family room downstairs. And um, I didn't know, but he had planned on giving me a ring. And my sister came in with her boyfriend, and he had just pinned her. And Ernie didn't want to, you know, ruin their hip hooray. So he waited, and I went up to the kitchen for something, and he followed. He tapped me on the shoulder, turned me around, grabbed my hand, and put the ring on my finger. Mm. Well, I dissolved. <laughs> I was so ecstatic. And that was Christmas Eve and the following August 10th, uh, 1957, we married. Did Please. you go to college for art, Jay? Did you? I went to classes? teacher's college. Well, in high school, they knew I loved art and the art teacher yeah. was very aware of it. But in those days, they didn't encourage young girls to go into a profession mm -hmm. other than teaching, being a secretary, or, or nurse. nursing. Yeah. And I knew I liked children because I did a lot of babysitting. So I elected to go to Teachers College in New Britain, which is now Central. I was there for two years. During my second year, my art instructor was really caught up in my artwork, and he said, Judy, you should be studying art. About what year was this, Judy? Um, let's see, I graduated in 52, 53. This was 54-ish. And um, he had graduated from Oberlin in Ohio, and so it was through him. Our minister in Rowayton, he and his wife both graduated from Oberlin. He from the Theological Seminary. And with everybody's help, letters of introduction went out to Oberlin and they accepted me. So with much trepidation, I drove out. My father drove, my stepfather drove me. And uh, I ended up in um, a wonderful dormitory. Uh, and uh, they actually had me the social chairman, which would have blown my mind before. <laughs> but we had a good time. But I had two art classes. One was life drawing, and I did extremely well there. Then the other was painting class. And the instructor I had was ready to tear his hair out because I was so detailed. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to stand me about 12 feet away from a 10 by 10 foot canvas and throw paint at it just to loosen up. And he said, why didn't you go to commercial art school? And I ground my teeth, remembering back when my advisor did not encourage me to do that. So I got home that summer, or beginning of summer, and I said to my parents, you don't need to scrape the funds to get me back to Oberlin. 
which I had really thought it was doing and signed up to live in French House, um, I said, I'm going to go out and get a job. I've got to find out my niche. I've got to find out who I am. So that took me to the workforce. And my first legitimate job, not babysitting, this was a good job at Burnby Corporation. And that's where I started doing artwork. The, um, just to move back slightly, were you already in Weston at that time? Or, or when no. did you and Ernie move to Weston? No, this why? was before we were married. This was, you know, right after I finished my third year of college. And uh, he was in the Navy. He had just gotten in. And... Um, this was like 55? 55, Yeah, 55-ish. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and I started there at Burnby, 55. Yeah, sometime in 55. And then, um, as I say, uh, Ernie came home one Christmas, we were married, and the uh, art director in the advertising department where I was gave me a letter of recommendation, knowing I was going to end up in San Diego where there was a large company called Convair. And uh, he gave me a wonderful letter of recommendation. And so Ernie and I drove out after we were married and uh, in a brand new car that his parents gave us as a wedding gift. Mm -hmm. was ready. His dad didn't want us driving back in a rental car or a secondhand car, which Ernie was going to get. And so we had this brand new Ford. Fort Fairland. <laughs> Anyhow, I did get the job at Convair and uh, really, really liked it. And I was in publications and they gave me pen and ink and I worked on the galley for this 880 aircraft, which I don't think ever was constructed. They, I don't know. I don't know what happened. But I knew I did something that I loved. <laughs> and then came back east because my sister was being married and I was expecting our first child. And Ernie's ship was going to be going out on maneuvers and then up to Mare Island to be refitted to handle. He was on a subtender. They, they wanted to refit it to handle the new nuclear subs. So all in all, it indicated I should come home. And he was due to get out in the following November. So it was only for a short time. And then after he got out of the service, he came, you both came back to Rowayton and then well, you no, moved to we, Weston? What we did, we found an apartment and because we weren't sure what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, the family up here in this house uh, was left, the only person left was Mary. And Mary, of the three children that Ebenezer and Nancy had, she was the only one who got married. And she married a Nathaniel Hill. And they had one child, a daughter, who in turn married a George Albin. They, in turn, had one child, and it was Ernie's father. So that's how this house ended up in just Ernie's father, because it was the only survivor, the only child. And Grandma Hill, as everybody had called her, um, she was up here and she fell, and she had no phone no plumbing, no wiring, no nothing. And she fell in the side yard. And fortunately, a milkman had come. And he heard her, she heard him, and she hollered. And he went next door to Minerva, Elizabeth Morehouse, Minerva Morehouse's mother, where she had a telephone. And uh, they called and asked for help. 
Long story short, Ernie's parents decided this was not the place for Grandma to live by herself, so they took her to Row Aiton. And she was there and passed away. Now, the house sat across from where it is now, and it sat on 170 some odd acres. This was could, before you moved in? Oh yeah, well before. And the house was moved across, I mean the house sat across the street on this large tract of land. Here where the house is now, there were 55 acres. Ernie's father was the only heir to this acreage. And it was draining him because it cost him taxes, but no money coming in. So he decided to put both tracts of land on the market, which he did. The larger tract sold. Buyers were not interested in the farmhouse. They were going to tear it down. Now, Ernie and I were married. We had our son and just had, or were expecting, our second child. When Ernie's father came to us and said, would you be interested in the farmhouse in Weston? Well, Ernie had never been inside except into the room in which we're sitting right now. The family used it as their sitting room. Uh, they never went into the kitchen, Ernie and his father, uh, family. They came up every Sunday to help the family with whatever they needed. And so when Dad offered the house to us, Ernie and I came up, walked through the house, and I said to Ernie, we'll never need any more house than this. This is perfect. So we told Dad, yeah, we would be definitely interested. So his comment to us was, we have to get it off the property it's on. And I'll pay for the move. You pick where you want the house to sit. Hmm. And then getting the plumbing, wiring, heating, and foundation will be up to you. So that's what we did. And Judy, this was about what year then? When, when did you this move was, here? We actually moved in. Uh, let's see. Dad proposed this in early 1960. And we came up and looked. And then um, the house was moved. Now, I think you told me before that the whole house came as is, that there it was did. furniture and everything else in it. Absolutely. I have on the counter a bowl that was in the house. I've got pieces of china in the cabinet here that were in the house. That white pitcher that I adore was in the house and in the kitchen. And none of it was broken. They moved this house like it was a new child. That's all I can say. It was lifted up, came across the road, down the driveway. They had to stop at one point because there was a cedar tree that knocked out the first pillar on the porch, which was that far pillar, because it came down that way. Then they turned it around. This lift had a turntable mm -hmm. that they were able to turn this house around and then they set it down on the foundation and removed the big beams. Uh, it was fascinating. <laughs> okay. We had a whole bunch of people out on the road mm -hmm. that came to watch this mm -hmm. maneuver. They're amazing. Yeah. And it yeah. was incredible. So now you find yourself in Weston and raising your children, but at some point um, you went back to work. Tell us how that story happened. Well, when my uh, oldest was in first grade, uh, his teacher sent home a note with him telling me that there was an opening down at the school and um, would I be interested in finding out about it and then if I was interested, you know, would I apply? Turned out it was cafeteria aid. They had had volunteer mothers come into the cafeteria. Well, they found that not all the mothers were reliable or something would come up and for some reason a mother couldn't be there. Trying to find substitutes was hair pulling. So they decided to throw it out and see if they could find somebody. 
And when I found out what it was that I would be monitoring about 165 kids <laughs> in a cafeteria, I thought, oh, <laughs> oh no. Um, but I thought, I'm going to give it a whirl, uh, a whirl because I was full of house care, laundry, kids, repeated day after day after day. And I knew there was more to life than this. So I wanted to taste it. So I said, yeah, I, I applied for the job and I was hired. And uh, it turned out to be a lot of fun. Uh, there was a PA system and I could use that to uh, remind some of the kids what they were supposed to do. <laughs> but I also found it was a tool that got them under control because I would say to them, the first group on a, at a table that is sitting quietly and all cleaned up can come up and use the speaker to do riddles and knock-knocks. Well, they thought that was the coolest thing. Clever. So then it was who was going to try and we can't help it. We were the last ones here mm -hmm. and, you know, sit quietly, be quiet cleaning up and you could still be chosen. Yeah. And it worked well, and I will never forget this, that one child came up and used the speaker and said, what do you see when you look through the knees of the devil? Nobody could answer it. So I looked at him and I said, you'll have to help them. Great balls of fire. <laughs> I took the speaker, the microphone away from him, and I thought, Oh my word, what have I done? What have I, what door oh, have I opened? Babes. <laughs> oh boy. But then eventually you went on to teaching, correct? Or well, a, te aid? a teacher's aid. They, they gave me more jobs to do. I did uh, an auditory discrimination program for kindergarten and first grade because the speech department was overloaded and found that a lot of these kids had uh, baby talk that they were carrying over. And once they were made aware of the correct initial sound for certain words. Hmm. And so I, I did this and I used as a helper, I created a puppet out of a sock and I named him Mr. Mears with remarkable lime green listening ears because I had lime green felt. <laughs> And uh, the kids thought he was great. And so as I would introduce a new sound, I would make Mr. Mears ears wiggle. And I said, see, he's listening. So, uh, and that worked. And I did that for a couple of years. They also had me go into a, a classroom as an aide to help the, um, they would have two grade twos together and uh, with the two teachers working together. And I would go in and help there. And then, uh, for the last uh, few years there, they had me become a math aide to help kids who were struggling in math. I could identify because that was one subject in school I hated, and I never did well. To this day, I hate math, but <laughs> I... Um, had the kids come, and because of my art, I was able to create some fun board games that they really liked. And gnomes were coming into fashion then, and the kids loved gnomes, and I created number gnomes. And I had a number gnome uh, board game, and I ended up in a small room over in the bottom of North House, and I called it the gnome home, the number gnome home. And um, the kids would come and every once in a while I'd have a new gnome and I'd wait to see how long it took somebody to notice. But more importantly, um, I also had a box that I called my energy box. And because we were scattered in three different buildings, if the kids didn't remember or the teacher didn't remember that they were supposed to send so-and-so to math, then they would have to use the speaker and break into the classroom, would you please send so-and-so? 
and I didn't want that to happen. So this box, I had in it chocolate chips, banana chips, um, different things that I knew kids who had allergies would still, I, oh, I had raisins, and um, different things to make them feel good. And the deal was, if you use your energy to remember your math day, and come over and do just what I ask you to do, I'll replace your energy out of my energy box. And they could open it up and take whatever they wanted that was in the energy box. They thought it was great. One teacher came to me after a few years of this. Judy, you've changed the status of supportive math. I've got more kids saying, when can I go to Mrs. Albin's math class? <laughs> so that was that was good to hear. I, that was a feather in my cap, so to speak. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you continued your hobby as an artist during all of this? Yes, because once the teachers knew I could draw, then it was, could you do something? Could you do this? Could you do that? Can you help with that? Mm -hmm. I know Grace Arder, one one person that sticks out in my mind right now, she was teaching the kids about wildflowers. And so she had me draw wildflowers, and one on a page. And then the kids would color it in, learn the name of it, and print the name mm -hmm. on their book. And then they would have this book of wildflowers. Did you have any time to do your own artwork? Um, you were pretty... <laughs> I like did some, busy. but not as much then when the kids were young and I was busy over at the school. Mm -hmm. uh, we had kids active in sports, and so that took a lot of the time too. So my art as such was in sewing something for my daughter for Christmas, or mm -hmm. Ernie and I would make something for one of the boys. And I didn't do that much then. Every once in a while, during the summer when the kids were home, mm -hmm. uh, I could sit at the table, either here or the kitchen, and do something because I was just interested in it mm -hmm. or wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And it was relaxation for me, and I needed that. Mm -hmm. So your interest in history, I know you said coming to this house and learning about Ebenezer instilled this interest in history and then into the historical yes, but society? Yes, the, the interesting part was we really didn't know how very interesting it was going to be until after Ernie's father had died. It was in 2001 or 2002 when Ernie's mother said to him, there's a box in the attic. Mm -hmm bring it down because I think you and Judy should go through this. It's material that we took out of the attic in Weston. So here on this very table, this big cardboard carton sat, and Ernie, who was a traveling salesperson, would, and he was 365 days a year except for vacation, he would be busy upstairs, but I would pull some of the things out and one of the things I pulled out was Ebenezer's letter mm -hmm. from California. And the first one I read was dated August 10th, I think. Um, maybe it's not here. Where do I? Oh, here. The first letter I read was uh, dated... Um, August 10th, 1851, and I pulled out this letter that I now have here, but um, I can show, here it is, and I'm sitting here reading this beautiful manuscript, his cursive is gorgeous, his spelling was atrocious, <laughs> but it dawned on me, my goosebumps got goosebumps when I realized I was holding the very paper upon which he had written, and it was from Murderer's Bar, August 10th, 1851. And I went, oh my word. And I put the paper down on the table and took my hands away from it 
And I thought, what do I do? I don't want to ruin it. Well, it's not ruined because it's still here in acid-free uh, folders. And then we found another th that told about his trip when he went to California. And he went through Panama. He didn't cross country. And I actually got a map and wrote down what he wrote and identified it here on the map and put it in writing so I could easily track. No Panama Canal, so there was quite a bit of work getting over there. And then he arrives in, uh, I finally arrived in the Golden State in the wonderful city of San Francisco, or the Golden City of San Francisco. And it took a while, many years before I researched Murderer's Bar, because in my mind, when I first read it, and I just let that be, I had always heard of stories in bars, drinking bars, where men who found mm. gold would fight over mm. it and they would knock each other silly, they would still steal each other's gold and or gamble it. And so Murderer's Bar, I'm thinking, oh man, Ebenezer was there? <laughs> then, because of a field trip to the Coley House, uh, and actually it was the post, post office, office yeah. when I had this letter pinned up on the board and I told the kids, when you go in to the post office, you will see up on the board a letter, three letters, that are dated 1851 and they came from California. One of them says it's from Murderer's Bar. And they just looked at me with their and I said, but I'm not going to tell you about it. You tell your teachers and see if your teachers can find out for you about Murderer's Bar. In the meantime, this person yeah. had to find them. <laughs> so I googled Murderer's Bar. And it was very simple where he got to the American River. There was the North Branch, the Middle Branch, and the South, and he went on the Middle Branch. And the mountains, the water would cascade down, hit a level area where some of the soil would collect, and then it would cascade down another and down another. Well, at one of these locations, there was a pile of bones. They weren't animal bones. Well, not wild. They were human bones. And so they deduced that there was quite a fight over gold because that's where they would pan for the gold in this soil. Yeah. And Ebenezer was there and he found good gold in Murderer's Bar <laughs> in that particular area. And he sent it home and he was out there from 1851 until 1859 he was 21 when he went out. His mother and brother were in a small house and he sent money out for them to have a house. Their father had died when Ebenezer was 17 and his older brother, um, David, uh, was with the mom, with their mother. And so the first house was built, which is now at Morehouse Farm Park. And then he had this house built. Both houses were built almost the same identical layout, um, built by the same people, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And um, then Ebenezer came back in 1859, and he married Nancy Bennett Rowland, who was the eldest daughter of a Judge Charles Rowland here in Weston. And I assume that they knew each other earlier and when he came home he reacquainted and they were married and then the three children. All right. Um, you mentioned um, that Ebenezer had sent back gold nuggets and you were able to get access to them for some use in the schools. 
Right. Well, this is what, um, what well, when we got the material from uh, Ernie's mother, we didn't get the gold at that time. That came much later. And um, when we did get it, at this point, we were ready to start a field trip with second grade. One of the second grade teachers started a program, Weston, Then and Now. And it was wonderful. Uh, and based on that, we used that theme, bringing the kids to the Coley House, because we talked about how they lived now and how people lived then a long time ago. And the Coley House is now part of the Western Historical Society's grounds? Uh, the um, Coley House was, yes, mm -hmm. it was already part of it. Um, so when we had the field trip, um, I would show the children a picture of the farmhouse and ask and tell them this was 150 years ago. Your house, does it look like this? What don't you see or what do you see here that you don't have at your house? And did the same thing with the school. And uh, the school picture I had shows kids on a roof and kids outside. How is this different? And what I wanted from them and finally did get, no playing fields, no school buses in sight, mm. nothing. And kids on the roof, can you get on the roof at your school? Uh, I think you'd get into a lot of trouble. You would indeed. <laughs> and uh, so we did that sort of thing. And then um, I told them that the house they saw in the picture um, was built by a man Ebenezer Moore House, who was my husband's great-great-grandfather. And I live in that house today. But he had it built with gold rush money. And he came back with gold. And so then, in my hand, I would hold out this gold nugget. And they would look at it and kind of, ooh. And I'd say, now, I'm not sure how heavy this is, but it's heavier than it looks. And so I would let each of them get a chance to hold the nugget. Well, that spread around that first group of second graders like wildfire. We get to hold real gold. <laughs> and they did. And this particular nugget, Ebenezer evidently had it fit with a pin so his wife could wear it at the top of her blouse. I removed the pin because I knew children were going to be holding mm -hmm. it and I wasn't going to wear it at the neck of a blouse. Then the other thing, Ernie's mother had this nugget on a charm bracelet and um, this was probably on a chain that she could wear around her neck and so, knowing you were coming here, I went to the safe deposit box and got these so that you could see them. And um, it's interesting, another part of the school, um, Mr. Mike Chapa, who is a science teacher at the high school and is still today a, a teacher up there, he contacted us and asked us if we would bring the gold nugget um, into his class so his class could see it. And we did. And he happened to have a class of seniors. And the larger nugget was the one we brought in. And it was passed around so every student had a chance to hold it, examine it, and then when it got back to the teacher, they used several different methods for weighing displacement as well as on a scale and something else. Then Mr. Chapa said to us, do you know if this is really pure gold? Have you ever had it tested? Ernie said, no, we just assumed that it's pure gold. And he said, well, would you let me test it? We said, absolutely. Well, this was the new wing of the science department and it had that in the wall uh, compartment that he could put chemicals that could be harmful to the class 
and it was closed off from them. There was a hole with a glove that he could go in and do things. So, this nugget was placed inside this glass compartment. And Mr. Chapa put his hand in there and he went to one of the bottles and got something out that he began to drop on the gold nugget. Now, we're all gathered up like kids in a candy store with practically our noses against the glass, watching these drops of liquid. And uh, Mr. Chapa said, so what is happening? There was silence, and finally one kid said, nothing. And he said, well, what does that mean? And then several said, oh, it's pure gold. And he said, absolutely. And with that, you know, they all kind of, yeah, <laughs> terrific. Oh, real gold. It was solid. It was much excitement. And then when um, Mr. Chapa finished and returned the nugget to Ernie, he said to him, would you approve, there's, there's a little piece of gold sort of hanging off here. Could I break that off and have it for future testing with the kids? Ernie said, absolutely. So he let him break off that small bit of gold that was big enough that Mr. Chapa could again test and say it came from somebody in Weston mm -hmm. who went out west and found it. Wonderful. Now you have other important documents that you brought to show. Yes, I brought because when we went through all of this material, um, we came across a leather diary and Ernie opened it up and he was shocked because it was dated January 1, 1863 and it was written by Rufus King Rowland who was Nancy Rowland Morehouse, Ebenezer's wife, we figured in her family. And at age 17, he went into the Civil War. Hmm. And his, his first, he tells about, his name is Rufus King Rowland, and he tells about that he's part of the Banks Division. And the uh, first entry is um, dated January 1, 1863, and he goes on until August is the last entry, and in the course of his describing, every, and he writes about every day, he tells that there's dysentery in the division he's in. He's down in Louisiana, and he talks about digging up uh, turnips and sweet potatoes in fields because they have no way of, you know, refrigeration. So they hunt for food as they travel. Anyhow, there's one entry that um, moved me immensely. Is it okay if I read this? Please do. He talks, oh, he talks about the weather just about every day. He said, cloudy and hot. Got off, oh gee got off the cars again this morning and cooked coffee. Don't know whether we are going anywhere or not. On guard all night and on the evening. Oh, and in the evening, I happened to think that it was my birthday and there I was on guard duty in the rain. And, oh, that hit my heart. And I thought, oh my gosh, he turned 18. And he's by himself on guard duty in the rain in some forsaken place down south. That really, really bothered me. And amid the horror of the Civil War. Oh, yes, amidst that. His last entry is dated August 10th. No, August 19th. And he writes in pencil this time. Some of them, most of them lately in this last part are pencil. 
and he writes one sentence, and then he writes the, and another letter, and the pencil slides down, and there's no more entry. And we knew he passed away that fall, and he's buried down in the Weston Cemetery, just above mm -hmm. the garden, along with all the whole family. Ebenezer, Nancy, Charles, Mary, mm -hmm. the whole group, and so Did is Rufus. Well, anyhow, he's there with the whole family. <laughs> he does go into quite a detailed skirmish that occurred, and um, it I would read it, but some of the writing is difficult, and I would mm -hmm. struggle mm -hmm. if I had redone it so I could read it clearly, I would do it, but that's kind of hard. Is this what precipitated you and Ernie doing that nice award for the high school in the history? No, this had nothing to do with Rufus. That came as a result of uh, Ebenezer's son, Charles, Charles Morehouse. In fact, when he was born, Nancy and Ebenezer named him uh, after her father, who was the judge Charles mm -hmm. Rowland, and he is known as Charles Rowland Morehouse. And he was a very good student and ended up teaching at the academy here in Weston. And during the course of his studies, he received many certificates of merit, which are these. And when we got involved at the um, Historical Society um, and the second grade field trip, I made colored copies of these certificates and gave each teacher enough certificates so that each of the children in her class could earn it. And they had had to do something that the teacher thought was worthy. Whatever it was, could have been a kind deed. It could have been, you know, gee, you did well on that paper. It would be up to the teachers. There was also a fun farmer's puzzle that I made copies of for the kids to do that. Then, when the history award was being awarded at the high school, they asked if we would be interested in doing anything there. And to honor Charles Roland Morehouse, Ernie and I decided that we would honor his memory by giving the History Award at the high school. And we've done it, I think, just about every year since then, which is very nice. It makes me feel good. I can certainly understand why. Um, so let's turn to a little different part of life in Weston. Uh, tell us about the friends you and Ernie had, what it was like to live in this neighborhood, um, things like that. Well, it was interesting because when we moved in, it was December. Uh, in fact, we moved in on December 11th, 1960. And it was a Sunday, and the last few pieces of furniture that were brought in, snow was falling on it. The next morning, Ernie got up to go to work, and he drove up the driveway. This is still our Ford that we had. And he was like a snowplow, and he couldn't get the car any further. So he got to stay home that day. <laughs> and... Um, we had no neighbors except, really, the Morehouse family across the way. And Blue Spruce Circle had just been started, and it got to the top of the hill. And there was a family in the first house up there. And that's all there were. Well, that spring, a friend of mine from Norwalk came up to visit me. And we had coffee sitting in the kitchen, and she said, Judy, how can you stand it living up here? There's nobody, no one around, nobody to sit and have coffee with. I said, Carolyn, I love it. 
every single window I go to, I look out and see God's greenery. I don't see any other woman's laundry flapping <laughs> in the breeze. I don't hear any other mother calling her kids. And I said, I've got nature, and I love it. She thought I was balmy. Well, not long, Blue Spruce Circle grew. And what happened, as each new family moved in, we would have either with the mothers, if they were home, uh, sort of a luncheon or a tea, mm -hmm. and then just so they got to know who they had moved in with. Bit by bit, that got to include husbands and wives, and we would have weekend parties, and uh, whether it was the holidays or just the doldrums, it's been so blah. Um, how about coming down Saturday night? A friends of ours uh, on Blue Spruce, I got to know very, very well the Brookover family, and Margaret was like my sister, my right arm. She was always there when a crisis occurred, and they happened. And But many times she would call and say, Judy, what are you cooking for dinner, like on a Sunday? What are you cooking for dinner tonight? And I'd say, oh, I'm not sure. I'm probably going to throw some oh, minute steaks on it. Well, bring them up, because we're going to have the grill going. And so I would take what we were going to have for dinner and add it to their meal, or vice versa. I would call and say, what are you doing about dinner? Oh, you're making that? We'll bring it down and we'll add to. And so the Brookover and Albin families were very tight-knit. and But it grew to other families, too. And it was a wonderful neighborhood. Um, then it got, over the course of years, got bigger and bigger. People moved away. And the people who moved in weren't interested in connecting. And we sort of lost that intimacy uh, for the most part. There are still some people that we keep close tabs with. But basically, that's it. And growing up, uh, having my kids grow up in Weston, it was fantastic. The kids could go out and ride their bikes all along up on the circle, down Valley Forge. I never worried about them. Today, I would never let a child ride on a bike other than where I could see them. Um, we, Ernie and I bought an above-the-ground pool and put it in. Nobody in the circle had a pool. And so I made up this invitation and put it in everybody's box and invited them to come down to the pool. I didn't know that what I ended up doing, it was like somebody had put a sign out front, summer day camp for boys, <laughs> because it was mostly boys. And uh, this house just rocked with kids. And then we would have parties. This chandelier that was raised up was raised up. This table was taken apart, stored in the laundry room. And we would dance. We had some people who played guitar and sang, and we had live music. And if it wasn't at this house, it was at Brookover's, it was anywhere up on the neighborhood where there would be a, a party. And we had the guys play their mm -hmm. guitars, and we just had the best time. How about some of the other people you knew in town, some of the people who volunteered or were selectmen or well, others that stand out in your mind? Well, we would see them, but... Uh, we did not socialize so much with them. Uh, one of the things that did help keep, though, a connection with them was that Ernie became a member of the fire department and an EMT person. And so there would be affairs dealing with them, and we got to know more of that personnel. And the fire department used to have their fireman's ball once a year which they don't do anymore. They stopped that a long time ago. And, um, but so we got to know them through that, and then church. We became members of Norfield Church and got to know people there. Our kids went to Sunday school. They went to confirmation class. 
And, um, and then my job at the school, I got to know some of the parents through the school work. And so we did get to know them, but our tightest social was really here for the most part. And then bit by bit, it spread around and grew. Okay. <laughs> uh, looking back, um, I know you, you know, came to Weston because of the Morehouse family. And what do you think their impact on Weston was? And what did they do to make this money and to make, make them so successful? Well, from what little I have been told about the family, uh, Ebenezer and Nancy, and them raising their children here. Um, bit by bit, they bought more land and they raised potatoes and onions and did a lot of haying. They needed to do what they could to supply their needs, and so they had their own garden. Uh, Charles, as he got older, and got into teaching, he was able to contribute to the family too. But in the meantime, farming was kind of going downhill. Mm -hmm. And um, Charles got into, because he was buying more land, there was a lot of wood, trees, and so he got into timbering. And then I think he met up with somebody else. The two of them together did some. I, I can't remember how I know this. And then that was not for very long. And then Charles continued on his own. And at one point, I understand, he had about 2,000 acres between Weston, Easton, um, and Fairfield, uh, and had quite quite a an elaborate deal going. Um, and this was before Valley Forge uh -huh. was dammed, right? And yes. The Duck 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 yes. All the before. Was built. Mm -hmm. Although, um, in the book *The Village of the Damned*, there is a uh, section and part of it where they talk to Charles, and mm -hmm. he recommended that the dam be built because he knew that it was going to help in the long run, not hurt. And the people living down in the valley were hurting. And uh, in fact, one of them, one from one of the families, actually came up and stayed at um, Lizzie Morehouse, Minerva Morehouse's mother and Minerva, and stayed with them for a period of time. She would sort of come and go, and um, but she was hurting, you know, being able to keep herself in good health. Um, so, so, so Charles was the one who began to sell it off eventually. Yeah, he began to sell off what he did after he had timbered it, and mm -hmm. bit by bit it was sold off, and. Um, I can't remember much about when he died. I just know it was in the early 20s, um, 1920s, 30s. Mm -hmm. I have the dates written down, but I just can't call them to mind. Minerva ended up deeding the property to Weston, the, what is she, now the Morehouse yeah, Park. She, she had watched the houses go up on Blue Spruce Circle and was very, very against it. She did not like it. Uh, unfortunately, some of the kids that lived in those houses would come into her property and they would wreak havoc. In fact, one kid started a fire that I remember standing in the front yard looking at the flames and I thought, if the wind picks up, the flame goes across mm -hmm. to pine trees, and we had a lot of pines, and I thought, we could lose our house if they can't control this fire. It was huge. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
one of Minerva's friends, Ruth Robinson, up, lived up on Godfrey Road. Mm -hmm. She came down, she was a good friend of Minerva's, and she came down with cat boxes because Minerva loved cats, <laughs> and she had about nine or ten of them. <laughs> and so they had to get these animals out of her house because they feared her house was going to burn. And it turned out this whole thing was started by one of the kids off the circle, playing around, and it got out of hand. Yeah. Okay. And then eventually she decided to deed the property to the town? Well, um, what happened was that she, Minerva mentally, was failing. And uh, we all knew it, but what can you do? You can't go to somebody and say, you can't live here anymore. Um, somebody tried that, and Minerva's temper came to the <laughs> fore. Talk about fires. Whew. <laughs> Anyhow, um, it was a postman who came to deliver the mail, and he saw her, and he called one of the police and said, this is not good. She was not Sorry, properly yeah. dressed, and she was, she was waiting for the mail, mm -hmm. and um, it, it, she just did not present a good picture. Yeah. So he let the police know, and in turn it. Steve let everybody else know. Yes, so that she could. got a lot of people involved. Now, because of all the houses being built, she was adamant that she didn't want a single house built on her property. No way. And one of the things that she would tell Ernie and me when we would be talking to her, she would love to see kids playing and hear laughter because she, as a, a child, and she was an only child, um, but she had her horse and she would ride through the fields and love it, and she felt good. And knowing that if kids were there having fun and playing games, she thought that would be great. So when the town approached her, she agreed to deed the property to the town for athletic fields, or even a school. Well, they tried the school bit, but that didn't work because of water problems, I think. And so she agreed that she thought the playing field would be great. And I know after the fields were in place, and I would be outside, and Ernie too, and we'd hear laughter and the kids cheering, and I'd look up at the sky and say, are you happy, Minerva? <laughs> are you happy with what's going on on your property? She must uh, have been. She mm -hmm. must have been. Absolutely. Yeah. Going back to your artwork, Judy, um, what types of mediums do you prefer? Uh, do you do oil painting, watercolors? I think you do everything, but... <laughs> well, uh, interesting that you ask because oils is oil paint is the one medium I stay away from. Uh, primarily because it takes so long for it to dry in between different colors. And I found because my daily life schedule, I didn't have the luxury of that kind of time. So I went to pen and ink, uh, I went to colored pencils, and then uh, when acrylics came out, I loved those, so I used those. And then got brave and started taking some classes in watercolor. And I have just loved doing watercolor. I've also was introduced, I was also introduced to etching on a fungus. Uh, a friend of my in-laws down in Rowayton had known about this. And he gave me my first piece of fungus. And he told me how it had to be really firm. It couldn't be this soft, spongy stuff. In fact, it grew, it's bracket fungus is what it was called. And back in the days when we had the Native Americans, on some trees they were able to use it like step ladders. It was on so firmly. And to get it off, you had to really whack away with an axe and clear the tree. Um, but he 
told me how you could etch with a sharp pointed instrument and it would look like, um, yes, what is it the Eskimos do? Scrimshaw. Scrimshaw. <laughs> That's exactly it. And I was, in, I was absolutely captivated by this. And um, I have done several pieces. In fact, one of the pieces that I'm most proud of, I have a picture of it up there, a pair of mallards. And that fungus was big enough, it was sitting on this chair, so it's as big as the seat of the chair. And when George Gadara owned Cobb's Mill, at one point I decided that I had no place really to put it here, but Cobb's Mill had ducks at one point, mallards, and I thought, you know, I talked to Ernie, let's go see George and give him the fungus. And he took it and he had it in Cobb's Mill until he left Cobb's Mill and he took it with him, which I was pleased that he took it because I gave it to him, not to Cobb's Mill. And um, so I used that pen and ink, as I say, uh, and then, um, oh yes, Blake Hampton in town had, um, he's an incredible artist, and he was doing this Schierenschnitz, mm -hmm. and uh, he did one of Norfield Church, which is cut out paper in layers to give a three-dimensional effect. He did one of Norfield Church, and I used to go there when I would be in the office, and I would stare at it and stare at it and examine it, and finally decided, I'm going to try and do this myself. So I did. And I did one of our house. It's small because it requires a deep frame. And, um... Well, we shall look forward to seeing some of that. Yeah, that and, was And we'll that be showing some of, of that. Fun. Yeah. And, um, concluding, tell us a little bit about, well, Give us some memory about some of the favorite things that you can look back upon. Well, one of the things I look back upon that I can talk about is not here. Oh, it's here. When I worked at Norden Systems, I was in publications and <coughs> loved every, every minute. And I managed to do one project that won an award for me from Norden Systems. I got this plaque and I got a certificate, uh, a financial certificate. And it was all for this book, Productivity Team Skills. It was that Norden used to use outside source for productivity team improvement. And then this one gal decided that they would do it in-house. And she came to me and asked if I'd be interested in working with her on this project. I said, sure. You know, why not? <laughs> so this is what I did. It was a five-day uh, deal, Monday through Friday. And every... Uh, uh, I have to turn pages, but I developed this character, and it was on the cover, and then all through the book, I used the character for illustration. Now I'm not finding any of them, but it was a challenge to come up with something that fit the topic, and then to come up with an illustration that would work, whether it was a technical illustration or these characters. And um, I wanted the character to be not feminine, not masculine, it just a character. And uh, because men and women were involved in this. And it was so successful that they had the um, 
pattern department cut one out character out of a piece of plywood, four by eight, and they did, and then they had a contest to name this character. And um, the person who um, won named the character Pip. Now, you, um, Norden was part of United Technologies, and they had to send this whole deal up to headquarters to get approval of the character itself and the name Pip. And this letter came back and it said that unless somebody outside disagrees, go ahead and use it, the character as well as the name Pip. So that's what happened. While I was there, I got to do fun things for the productivity team. And these are copies uh, of some of the posters that I did. And um, communications, and they're all loose. And then, oh, this one was fun. <laughs> and then there was, uh, yeah, just, uh, oh, here again, productivity potential from the acorn to the mighty oak. And uh, these are all things that I created. So my creativity was growing, my creative thinking, because you know, with anything, the more you're asked to do, the more you do it, and the more you do it, the easier it becomes until it's worn out. <laughs> well, say, we can certainly see sorry. why you have such. We can certainly see why you have such great pride in your your art and your creativity. Oh, I've just always enjoyed it. I've always enjoyed using it wherever. Like Dr. Tomasella, who was principal at the elementary school. Um, after I left Norden, I went back. My final days were ten years in kindergarten as a kindergarten aide. Oh gosh, I. I loved it, loved it. I would whistle my way in and think, gosh, they're paying me to do this? <laughs> I mean, this is unbelievable. But Dr. Tomasello realized that new kindergartners, you know, they can't read. And here they were going into Miss So-and-So's class or Mrs. So-and-So's or Mr. So-and-So's. And he said, you know, Judy, maybe you could help me out. Suppose we go to each teacher, have them decide what book character they really like mm -hmm. that's of that mm -hmm. level. And I would take that book character, and Ernie gave, made wood plaques for me, and I painted the characters on the plaques, and they were mounted just outside the kindergarten doors. So the kids got to know, oh, I go to the class with the big red dog. Um, <laughs> I go to the class with, and it worked, and he was so pleased with the result that it helped the kids. Well, you've, you've given us a real great glimpse into your creativity mm -hmm. and, and your work with children and you as a teacher. and Your love so, of Weston and his family. Absolutely. Oh, gosh, yeah. So now leave us with a few words of wisdom. What would you tell <laughs> someone growing up today or, or, or some thought? Of, just very simply, follow your heart. You know what makes you feel good and you know is uh, going to create good. Um, and make you feel proud of having done it. That's, mm -hmm. you know, what else can you say? We, we all have to work. We all have to live with one another, we all have to contend with things, and so just do the best you can and do what you love doing, and uh, when you make others feel good, that makes you feel good. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you, Judy. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful.